This is a Japanese goldfish. I was in Kyoto recently, and I found this fish. But how many of you can see the turtle? <laughs> it's a turtle right there. So I want to begin, because we discussed this last night, actually, at dinner. This is my daughter, Celia. She's now 23, but in, when this photograph was taken, she was uh, seven years old. And uh, she is holding what I call Schrodinger's cat, actually Schrodinger's kitten. Uh, unfortunately, this kitten was eaten by a fox one week after the photograph was taken. <laughs> so this kitten lives in the slide, but actually is dead. So it's very. So I recently learned that I was uh, a Nobel laureate. And when you get this phone call from uh, Stockholm, you immediately think that you can walk on water and be in two places at the same time. So Celia, you know, is supposed to be some kind of genius. As you can see, I'm not any kind of genius. So Celia asks this funny question, why is the ceiling opaque, bedtime? Why? What a funny question to ask. So I, you know, I mean, I thought, well, it's obvious light can't get through the ceiling. But then I looked at her window and the glass of her window, and I thought, oh, my God. How do photons get through glass? And I first thought, well, maybe I'm a biologist, you see, very bad physicist. I, maybe there are little holes between the molecules that the photons can get through. And I thought, no, that's, that's silly. And then I remembered glass is a frozen liquid. And other liquids, like water, light can get through. But then I thought, oh, no. That won't work. Mercury, the metal mercury, is a liquid. And you make mirrors out of mercury. So that can't be the answer. And then I thought, well, let's think about the element carbon. Now, the element carbon makes black things very black. But carbon can also make diamonds. And you can really see through diamonds. So that immediately tells you, or told me, that the secret of whether you can, light can go through something depends on the electrons. Because the structure of the crystals in diamond and carbon black is, is different. And then, I started to ask people, and um, then I hit trouble. And I asked a friend of mine who I thought would know the answer, and he said, well, Tim, you really need to understand Schrodinger's equation. And my heart sank. Now, here is Schrodinger, and uh, he's a very great scientist. And he, indeed, was one of the great pioneers of quantum mechanics and explained about the interaction of photons and electrons. And I like his statement. He's a very wise man. Science is a game, but a game with reality. OK, that's really important. You can dream, but you have to be able to test your ideas against reality. And that really is what distinguishes science. Now, here is Schrodinger's equation. This is actually Schrodinger's tomb in a place called Altbach in, near, near, uh, in, in Austria. And um, for me, this is completely incomprehensible. I have no idea what this equation means. It starts in a very unpromising way with I. And as you probably know, I is the square root of minus 1. And I always had trouble with complex numbers. I really couldn't. Then h bar is, of course, Max Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. And then we come to psi dot. 
which is, as you know, the rate of change of the wave function with respect to time. And that equals the Hamiltonian times the wave function. Now, I don't know what a wave function is, actually. And I still less do I know what a Hamiltonian is, but I know where Hamiltonians come from because that's Hamilton. And Hamilton is a mathematician who invented the Hamiltonian. Actually, the Hamiltonian is quite a big, complicated expression. And it contains at least one symbol that I don't even know how to pronounce. It's an upside-down Greek delta, capital delta. So anyway, all of this made me realize that asking a very simple question, how does light get through glass, has a very complicated answer, which is understood extremely well by some people, but not, alas, by me. I would love to understand why it is that glass lets photons through and the ceiling does not. And if I could explain it to you, I would, but I can't. But I do know about some things, and I'm going to explain to you what I know about. Oh, yeah, this is a, <laughs> Dirac was a very, another great contributor to us. <laughs> so after all this, you know, the Schrodinger's equation, he says, the problem of getting the interpretation proved to be rather more difficult than just working out the equation. <laughs> so, you know, and this is, well, anyway. So, um, the other reason for introducing Schrodinger is that he wrote a little book. In fact, he gave these lectures in the very month that I was born, in 1943, during the Second World War. And the book is called What is Life? And this was a book that in particular inspired um, Jim Watson and I think Francis Crick a little bit too. Uh, and, you know, you may like to think about how you would define life. But I think one of the best definitions is this one here. It's in French. The, life is those things that resist death. So you define life in terms of what happens when you don't have life, rather than, in fact, what it, what it is. But Schrodinger, in his book, asks this. How can the events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism, be accounted for by physics and chemistry? And at the time, a lot of people would have said, you can't explain life in terms of physics and chemistry because life has some special force all of its own, an almost sort of religious belief, if you like, in the, in the power of life. So how did I become a biologist? Well, I grew up in Oxford, and my father had an office in this building here, and here he is. He was a historian and a librarian. And in this picture, he is reading. Can you see what he's reading? No, I can't from here. It's in Greek. So he could speak Latin and Greek and read Latin and Greek. I found that I was very bad at reading Latin and Greek when I was young. Um, so fortunately, I had a wonderful science teacher. And the science teacher taught me that I was a very bad physicist, I've already explained that, but a pretty good biologist. I found that thinking about the world in a biological way came to me very naturally without having to work at it. And I found that out just by taking a school exam and doing very well in, in, in that exam. And I think, I, th I think that was right. So from about when I was 11 years old, I sort of knew that I could be a biologist, and I loved, I was very curious about the world and how it worked, not especially in biology, actually. I would have much rather have been an electrical engineer or something like that, but, but uh, you know, biology is what I could do, and then later on, chemistry. And he was a wonderful teacher. There were no, in the school where I went to, there was no set curriculum uh, actually, examinations, if there wasn't it, the exam, the only restriction was that three terms should be devoted to physics, chemistry, and biology in rotation. <laughs> uh, and the headmaster just gave it, just get the boys interested. Brilliant advice. So we had explosions and smells and sparks and 
you know, electrical motors and stuff. And he ran a science, Gert ran a science club, and it was, it was all terrific. We had one lesson per week, and I looked forward to that lesson very much. Now, so then I went on to a secondary school, and I began to read about science. And my first real hero, actually, was a heroine, Madame Curie, because I read a biography of her when I was maybe 14 years old. And she was, a, any of you, maybe anybody read the story of the life of Madame? I do recommend this. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. I mean, she was one determined young woman. And uh, she won two Nobel Prizes, actually, one in chemistry and one in physics. And she was fantastic, really fantastic. She came from Poland, and she overcame a number of problems, was a great pioneer in the study of uh, radioactivity, and went to conferences with Einstein and uh, the rest of them. A very inspiring story. But I, you know, I wasn't a physicist, and... Um, Radioactivity was kind of scary, and, but I was pretty good at chemistry, too. And as a, as a student, I used to, in Oxford, to go to what were called extramural lectures. They were lectures by lecturers in the university that you could go to, uh, and they, I think they take place on Tuesday nights at half past eight or something like that. And so I would go, and one of the lecture series was about biochemistry. And uh, the lecturer came from the biochemistry department. And I, because I was good at biology, the bio and the chemistry, it seemed a good combination. And he talked about all these complicated pathways that made up life. And I thought, gosh, that's, that's good, interesting. But the, at the time, you know, there seemed to be nothing controlling these pathways. And I wondered. There must be controls, and in fact, when I was an undergraduate, about maybe two or three years later, those controls began to come into view. So already, I think, I was sort of beginning to have a reasonably intelligent and sensible approach to these, these things. I knew that what he was telling us was okay, but it wasn't the whole story, and I, I've always been much more interested in how things are controlled than what actually happens. I mean, of course, first you have to know what happens in order to know what is controlled. But it turned out, actually, sometimes you can learn a lot about what is happening by studying the controls, as you'll come to. So um, you know, I left Oxford and went to Cambridge, where I started to become, started to learn how to become a scientist. And I think my experience would say that, you know, maybe it took me about uh, 10 years to begin to be a a decent scientist, and I would say one goes on learning all one's life. You know, you never really get there. Always, always, always learning new things. Learning new things, I think, mostly in my case, by making mistakes. You get things wrong, and you do an experiment, and nature comes and tells you, you know, that's good, Tim, but not quite right. So, you know, you have to correct your ideas a little bit all the way along the line, and that, 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 that's... That's very good. When that happens, you know that you're doing good science because you usually guess a little bit wrong and you have to correct it by experiment. So Cambridge, of course, is a very famous university. It's still one of the best universities in the world by some measures at any rate. And the tradition of science there was fantastic. And I was very well aware of those traditions. I mean, quite apart, I mean, Newton was a long time ago. But Maxwell is a 19th century, and Thomson is the end of the 19th century. So most of the stuff about atomic physics, many of the pioneering discoveries were made in, in, in Cambridge. And then that led to people, because of the use of x-rays, to study the structure of DNA and the structure of protein. And in one way, you know, if you were a student there, this was very inspiring, but it was also a very intimidating kind of, you know, there was a big high level of expectation. I mean, I never imagined that I could match the achievement of these giants of science, and I wouldn't say that I, I really had, except that I think in some ways scientists are actually really rather simple people, and they're all really basically the same. I mean, uh, the one thing... Nobel laureates have a habit, you know, they're, they're, 
they're not, they don't come in any simple one size fits all. They're very, very variable. And I, I, from my experience of meeting several of them, because there were a lot of them in Cambridge in molecular biology, they share one common, which I think they have a really rather, they're really rather simple minded. The trick is to make things simple so that you can understand them. And when I was your age, I was always trying to make things very complicated and sophisticated. The trick is to get to the underlying simplicity, because then you can really understand it. Our brains are not that powerful. So you've got to try and, try and keep it simple. But to get to that simplicity requires a high level of sophistication. Anyway, here are Jim Watson and Francis Crick. And Francis was my hero, actually, because he seemed to know everything. He was a physicist by training, but he had a very good biological sense. And, and Jim was, has been very kind to me. Um, I won't explain any further. So I did well enough in the exam, so I passed. I'd do a PhD in biochemistry. And the first problem, and this is a big problem for scientists, is how do you find a good problem to work on? So I went to my supervisor who I liked very much. His name was Asher Corner. And I said, Asher, what shall I work on? And he said, well, why don't you go to the library and find yourself a problem? So I went to the library. I found a great problem to work on. And luckily for me, it didn't work because I used the wrong kind of rat. I won't describe what the problem was. It was it, I think it was a good problem. I think as far as I know, it has not been solved to this day. And I doubt whether if I'd worked on it, it would have been solved either. But fortunately, after about six months of failure, I went to the, my very first scientific meeting. And it was quite close by. It was just about a quarter of a mile down the road from where I worked. And it was a meeting about hemoglobin. And this man, who was at Caltech, uh, gave a talk. And the talk was comparing early development of sea urchin eggs. What's sea urchin? Umi, is that right? Yes, umi. Uh, compared with erythropoiesis, that's the development of red blood cells. Well, sea urchin eggs and red blood cells have rather little in common, except they're both round. <laughs> um, but that's what he'd worked on. And then the other talk that really sort of meet the inside was given by this man here, Vernon Ingram, who was a man who worked out what was wrong with sickle cell anemia. He discovered there was a single amino acid changed in hemoglobin. And I think it's valine six of the beta chain. Anyway, but what uh, um, Vernon was trying to solve was hemoglobin uh, is a protein. I, I love this is actually myoglobin, which is what makes mussels and tuna fish red. Okay, and the red color comes from the heme group, which binds oxygen, and the the, the heme group is nestles in a thing called the um, heme pocket on the surface of the protein, OK? And the question that Vernon was asking, when does the heme join the protein? Because the heme is a special group that's made in the mitochondria, and that has to be put in at some point. And his theory was that uh, it was put in, so we, we just heard and saw a nice movie of how the ribosome works. So the, 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 the hemoglobin is made, and then at some point the heme pocket was made. And the theory that uh, Ingram came up with was that the uh, heme was put in while the protein was being made. And if the heme was not there, then the ribosomes waited until it came. And so the ribosomes would form a queue behind the place where it... Well, that was all, and he presented some evidence that this was the, the case. Again, I, it's a little bit technical. Uh, and I thought, gosh, that's really, really interesting. Went back to the lab and told my friends about this. And when we worked out what the evidence was, we realized that Ingram had got it completely wrong. He'd absolutely totally misunderstood his own data. And so we decided that we would uh, have a look for ourselves. This was a really interesting problem, so why not study it? And it, I must say, in retrospect, this seems fairly foolhardy. I mean, you know, but there we go. Uh, 
And when I say we, the two very important people, Lou Reichart was a, the, an American who just spent the first year there, and he was working on the same kind of thing. And then Tony Hunter uh, joined about a year later, and actually Tony and I sort of did our PhD more or less in collaboration together because it was quite, quite tricky. And we were reasonably successful, and we found uh, some stuff out. But I won't go into that. And along the way, I went to the second meeting. And this, the second meeting I went to was in a little bit later in 1966, first meeting in 1965. Uh, and this one was in Greece. And I made my way overland to Greece. And there I met this man here who worked in New York. And it turned out that we had a, an interest in this heme question together. And uh, I spent a very happy summer with him as a graduate student. I was one of those rare graduate students who had a kind of a sabbatical three months in New York. And I, I really liked working in America. And I really liked Irving. And his family was in Woods Hole at the time. And so we often went out to dinner together and discussed our problems. And I liked the way the American lab worked. And, this, and then I went back to work with him as a, as a postdoc. And by this time, we had a cell-free system that replicated the, the heme business. So if you add heme, you get protein synthesis. So this is time running along the bottom, incorporation of radioactivity into the protein up the side. And you see, if you have heme, it goes at a beautiful, steady rate. And even though you've taken away the cells, broken them open, they do it pretty much the same rate they would have done in real life. So this was a very studyable system for a biochemist. And if you don't add heme, uh, it starts off a bit and then turns over and dies. So the question is, what is the heme doing? And m most remarkably, uh, if you add back the heme, then it, it, it recovers and takes off. So this control is reversible. And a very important fact was that you could make this preparation from immature rabbit red blood cells and freeze it in liquid nitrogen. And you could then thaw out the tube, and you could do an experiment any time of the day or night that you wanted. So it was a very beautiful, beautiful um, system. But we didn't get very far, in fact. Uh, and it, uh, this is a sort of typical thing. And I began to get irritated by the problem because we made so little progress. And I started having, after my technician went home in the evening, I started doing naughty secret projects at night which I wasn't supposed to be doing. And this, this one was really trying to uh, map some genes in polio virus. And I, again, I won't go into the details of why. And what we discovered, and this was done in collaboration with Ellie Ehrenfeld, was that um, we didn't succeed in translating polio virus, but we did discover that double-stranded RNA was a very powerful inhibitor of protein synthesis in our system. And it inhibited. Heme is present here, it inhibited in very much the same way that leaving out the heme was. And that was very peculiar. And what's more, uh, you needed tiny amounts. You said, uh, Ada said, you know, a cell contains millions of ribosomes. So a HeLa cell, typical uh, cell in culture, contains about 10 million ribosomes. One molecule of poliovirus double stranded RNA can inhibit synthesis by all 10 million ribosomes. So it had to be catalytic. And we had absolutely no idea how on earth could double-stranded RNA inhibit in, 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 in this way. And with exactly the same characteristics as leaving out the heme. So chemically, there was absolutely nothing in common. It was very bizarre. Now, fortunately, I, you know, and I didn't we, we couldn't work out what was going on. And the reason why we couldn't work out what was going on was because we actually didn't know what was going on. We, we were too ignorant about the process of initiation of protein synthesis. And I went back to Cambridge and joined forces with this man here. Jim Watson had very good advice. He said, if you possibly can, always try to work with people who are cleverer than you are. It's very good advice. So I worked with Richard, who was an extremely clever person. And we made a very good uh, team together. And then in 1974, the lab burned down. And this was the best thing that could possibly have happened to us. Because uh, we had to move labs. 
And because the university had a great insurance policy, which meant that we got all new equipment. <laughs> and we moved up the road to a very famous lab, uh, the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And um, Max Perutz, who was the director at the time, was extremely kind to us. He said, you can use our stores and the stores were great. They had absolutely everything. And they had the simplest accounting system ever. You went into the stores and you said, could I have some ATP, please? And you would write 10 grams ATP in this little book. And then the storeman would do the rest. No filling out of forms, no computerized, nothing. Just say what you had. Great. Um, all new equipment. And perhaps an even greater gift was that his wife ran the canteen and he said, you can come and have lunch in our canteen. And this was an amazing gift because the place was full of wonderful scientists. Several, I think the LMB has now got 11 Nobel Prizes. They weren't all there or at the, at the, at the time. But uh, you, know, you sat down at lunch, and Francis Crick would come and explain about nucleosomes and DNA and things like that. It was a fantastic experience for a young scientist. And we explained to each other, and actually many of my contemporaries went on to win Nobel Prizes from, from that place. And partly as a result of that, partly also because actually at the time we were really very badly confused. And this, this fire just sort of cleaned out everything. It destroyed all the old data, so we had to start fresh. And curiously, that, you know, I think that in some ways cleaned our minds. And, and we very quickly found the answer. And the, the answer was, uh, I apologize for this is one dimensional SDS polyacrylamide gel, and not everybody knows what they are. But uh, you can see, I think, that this thing here is a lot stronger than it is here. And this is an initiation factor of protein synthesis, a eukaryotic initiation factor two. It's the key regulator of protein synthesis. And it gets phosphorylated when we add double stranded RNA. OK, so uh, how does that work? Well, you take a phosphate off ATP and you stick it on a protein here. That's the residue there is going to get a phosphate. And this thing here, for example, this is just a simple example, is 100 times more active than the one on the left. The, the changes are very, very subtle. But in practical terms, it makes a huge difference to the activity. Now, phosphorylation can do lots of other things. It can also inhibit enzymes. Phosphorylation can sometimes result in two proteins joining together. Phosphorylation can sometimes result in two proteins being. So you, you have to do the experiment. You can never tell ahead of time. But it's very commonly used. Even, you know, every time I move a muscle, something is getting phosphorylated in. That's how, that's how I move. <laughs> Uh, so that was a very simple, uh, simple answer. And it was my first real example of, you know, the, the very simple question, how does heme control protein synthesis? The answer is it controls a protein kinase. And that explains everything really easy. So then uh, we sort of, you know, this is another interesting scientific dilemma. Once you've solved your problem, which we sort of had, I mean, there were many details to be filled in. You don't have a problem anymore. And this is a very scary situation to find yourself in as a scientist, because if you don't have a problem, you can't work on anything. And finding a good problem, something which is interesting and which you think you can solve, is, is hard. So uh, we had a, a meeting about the control of protein synthesis. And I invited a man called Tom Humphreys, who uh, came from Hawaii, who would worked on this problem which I didn't mention about, well, I had sort of in passing about sea urchin protein synthesis, and we'll come to that in just a second. And it turned out that Tom was a very keen cyclist and wanted to go for a cycle ride to take some exercise during the meeting. And he said, can I rent a bike somewhere? And in those days, no, you couldn't. So I lent him my bicycle, and we became friends because of that. And later on, he said, uh, would, here is Tom. Uh, he said, would you like to come and teach in the embryology course at Woods Hole. And we maybe could do some experiments on sea urchin eggs and their protein synthesis. So uh, I leapt at the chance, because Woods Hole is a very beautiful place. Uh, the lab is uh, somewhere in, in there. Uh, and it's, it's surrounded by the sea. It's a little bit like Okinawa, actually. 
um, lovely. And here are the sea urchin eggs. And here is some sea urchin sperm. And if you mix the eggs with the sperm, it was perfectly true um, what the man from Caltech had said, namely that uh, protein synthesis starts up. So here again is a switch point. But in this switch point, it's something turning on rather than something turning off. So I thought, why don't we study that switch? So good problem. Actually, not a good problem. It still hasn't really been solved, but still. You'll see. So, but along the way, that was a, you know, this is a biochemist's analysis. But much more interesting is the cell biologist's analysis. Uh, here they are. Um, so I'm now going to fertilize these sea urchin eggs with my clicker. OK? Now watch carefully. They start dividing. This is speeded up, of course. And do you see, when they divide, they divide amazingly synchronously. You could, they all divide within about five minutes of one another. So the first division is about one hour, and then subsequent about half an hour. Point. Really regular. Now, I thought nothing about that, really. And then, uh, this was a long time ago, uh, John Gerhardt, who was an expert in the control of enzyme activity, came and gave a talk about what he was thinking about, which was frog oocyte maturation. Uh, you won't immediately see the, the connection. First of all, what is an oocyte? Well, all the women in the lab have oocytes inside them. They are the cells which will become eggs. And the process of maturation is what happens in human females once a month, that an, an oocyte matures and becomes a fertilizable egg. Uh, in the case of frogs, a female frog in the springtime is absolutely full of eggs, uh, full of oocytes, and uh, the, the hormone progesterone uh, causes their maturation. And again, I will add some progesterone with my clicker, and you'll see what happens. Watch here. See, a white spot appears in the dark half. And if you look underneath that white spot, what you find is that the cell has actually initiated meiosis, and... Under the white spot, this is uh, what is known in the trade as a second meiotic spindle, OK? And uh, it was a Japanese worker who discovered what was going on. Progesterone actually activates an enzyme that catalyzes uh, a cell cycle transition from just before cell division, G2, into M. M phase. And what he discovered was that the, the active substance was an enzyme, which was heat labile and protease sensitive. And he discovered that by sucking out the contents of about 50 nanoliters of a, a mature egg and injecting it back into a, to an oocyte. And that, now the trouble was, that what was this stuff? And it was terribly unstable. And all you could say was that the, the, this MPF was high in dividing cells and low when the cells were in between. And um, wasn't clear what turned it on, wasn't clear what turned it off, or what it was. And uh, so it catalyzes this, this, this process here from G2 into M, the process of segregation of the chromosomes. And I, at the time, was sort of interested in, uh, by reading this book, in artificial parthenogenesis. That's virgin birth. And I did a very simple experiment to try to compare eggs which were properly fertilized with eggs that were parthenogenetically uh, stimulated by things like ammonia or calcium ionophore. And I did this experiment, and what I saw was at a protein that you could detect very early on. Here you can see it suddenly disappear. And that, you're looking at, is a Nobel Prize winning experiment, basically. Because nobody had ever seen a disappearing protein like that before. Because you see, most of these proteins don't disappear. It's perhaps clearer here. This is now clam eggs. And you can see there are two of these proteins which come and go and come and go in time with the cell division cycle. And because of what Gerhardt had told me I sort of said, gosh, I, you know, this coming is what causes entry into mitosis, and this going is what turns it off. 
And everyone looked at me and said, nah, that's far too simple. It can't possibly be, don't be ridiculous. And you know, you're getting excited by all this. But it turned out it was really true, but it took a long time to find out. And I'm running out of time, so I can't <laughs> tell you properly. Uh, Suffice it to say that I, 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 I knew Lee Hartwell, and he had mutations, and Paul Nurse had mutations, and these mutations could not divide. And uh, here, is, here is Paul and two wonderful graduate students who uh, helped to clone and sequence cyclin, the disappearing protein. And basically, in the end, with some help from our friends, and indeed, a little bit of help even from somebody at Tokyo Tech, uh, not this Osumi, another Osumi. <laughs> Apparently, it's a common name, but uh, worked out how to make cell-free systems. And in the end, it turned out that MPF was a complex of my protein with Lee Hartwell and Paul Nurse's protein. And that was the answer. And not only that, but it went back to my previous thing because the answer was it was a protein kinase. So we'd sort of come full circle. And basically, the answer is terribly simple. So the cyclin accumulates. That turns on CDC2. That's CDC2 on the left here, cyclin on the right. And if you don't turn it on, this loop of protein uh, gets in the way of the activity of this, the protein kinase. So my, my protein is just an activating uh, subunit. And this, again, was, was terribly satisfying to figure it out, because what had appeared to be incredibly complicated and mysterious was actually very, very simple. Now, there are some problems. So basically, uh, hundreds of proteins, when a cell divides, hundreds of proteins get phosphate stuck on them, and that changes their properties in all kinds of mysterious ways that we still do not properly understand. Uh, at the end of mitosis, all those phosphates are removed, and that's, a, that's another story. And um, it, it's, really, it's, 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 really, it's really very simple. I won't go into this. Um, and I think, I, I hope that what you can see is that the road of science, you don't sort of start out with an idea, I'm going to solve how the brain works. You sort of take problems as they come, and they, you know, the, path, the path is a winding one over the hill. This path may continue, it may not. It may turn to the left, it may turn to the right, it may go straight on. And you can't tell until you get there. And I think that's perhaps an appropriate place to end. Thank you very much. <laughs>